Welcome to the third episode of Drinking with Los Hermanos. It's me, Tristan. I'm here with Jeremy Andrews. Many of you probably know him, but we're going to learn a little bit more about him. Jackson's not here because he's at work right now, but he'll be here. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, Jeremy, tell us a little bit about you and uh, how you kind of became the person you are today. Okay. Um, well, I uh, was born and raised here in Battle Creek. Um, I was born uh, just a couple weeks after Elvis Presley died, so I had a lot of thoughts about what that is and who I really am. I'm uh, reading hard, I didn't Right, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and I look a lot like him physically, like right around the moment that he died. <laughs> kind of fat and disheveled. All right. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I, uh, I graduated uh, from Lakeview High School. I then uh, quickly escaped. Battle Creek as fast as I could, just like a lot of my friends, uh, because I didn't want to live here. I didn't want anything to do with this place. Right. It sucked to me, and uh, I went off to college for a little while. Kind of rambled. I uh, went to college. I spent some time in France studying French. Uh, I ended up getting my degree in French, but it took me about seven years because I didn't quite go to school all the time. In uh, France? No, uh, I, I did get, I did do a bunch of study in France, but I did not get my degree there. It was sort of like study abroad. Okay. Credits, yeah. credits went to a degree at Western. Um, moved around the country. Um, kind of, I don't know, I kind of thought I was uh, some sort of a vagabond, like learning about my, learning about people, mm -hmm. getting odd jobs here and there in my 20s. Um, drove a Volkswagen bus around the country and had jobs in uh, Dayton, Tennessee, being a uh, a footrest foam stocker at the Lazy Boy Chair Factory, lived in Reno, Nevada, worked in car washes and hotels, uh, and Portland, Oregon, uh, had my own eco handyman business. Uh, I had a lot of jobs um, in my 20s, like 32 of them, I think. Um, I tried a lot of things. Slid in line. And uh, <clears throat> um, I don't know whether one should be proud of having 32 jobs or not, but I, I kind of think it's a, <laughs> it's a badge of honor. I didn't get fired from any of them. Um, I would probably fire me now. <laughs> uh, I uh, moved back home uh, when I was uh, almost 30. I uh, wanted to have a family, I wanted to have kids, and so I decided to move to Battle Creek because I did not want to have to spend all my vacations here mm -hmm. and have to, have to spend every right. you know, summer here, Christmas is here. That was, that was my logic. I was like, well, I'm just going to move there, that way I can vacation somewhere else and I, my, my family can grow up next to my family, my extended right. family. Uh, but I told myself when I came back here in 2006 that uh, I wasn't going to complain about it anymore, that I made a choice to move home and I was going to do whatever it took to make it a better place for me, maybe for some others, but I was going to um, make the battle pretty cooler without asking for permission. Kind of talking about do shit. Right. Um, I didn't know what that meant, uh, but I, got, I moved, came back and moved in, into a house in the historic north side got to know that neighborhood. I did not grow up in that neighborhood, but that was a neighborhood that at the time was only a 17 minute walk from Arcadia Brewing Company, and that, uh, that meant a lot to me. Uh, so uh, that was one of the reasons I chose to uh, live downtown. You still live there now? I don't. Um, it's a rental property. Uh, some, some friends of mine still live there. Uh, I moved in with my uh, wife um, in uh, the north, north side in Washington Heights on the Bascon, so we have a small farm there. Uh, we, uh, so I moved downtown, I got to know my neighbors, got to know my neighborhood, got to know that there were other people involved in neighborhoods, um, learned that we had all of these nonprofits in town doing interesting stuff with each other and that you could write grants and do cool stuff with your neighbors and clean up neighborhoods and you know, take classes together and then I started just exploring that and um, uh, learned how to write a grant and got some money to do some stuff with some friends. And then I thought, wouldn't it be uh, uh, cool to throw cool parties with friends and like have have a bunch of fun, like create create the events that are missing that right. that, that, that were in some of the towns that I lived in, and uh, uh, I was turning thirty and I thought it'd be fun to have a uh, mustache contest for my birthday. 
So I got a bunch of friends. I, I told them that we were going to provide free food and free beer if they could say show up. If they showed up with a mustache, and uh, so we had a mustache and cleavage contest so that uh, other people could show up uh, that couldn't grow mustaches, and um, <laughs> we there were like about forty dudes with ridiculous mustaches at this place, um, and in like our you know overly hopped up uh, evening, I proclaimed that we would do it for charity the next year. Uh, that is where the Mustache Society was birthed. Okay. And then I, um, so I sort of learned how to organize people at that moment and got dudes together that wanted to create a Mustache Society with me. And we created the BC Manics, uh, which stands for the Battle Creek Metropolitan Area Mustache Society. Uh, we named it before we started it. Uh, we got together at Arcadia about 10 years ago and uh, what I thought it was going to be is not what it became. It became something way bigger and way sweeter because we uh, were a group of people, not just me, collectively. And yeah, we collectively thought it was, uh, hey, what do you think we should do? And we came up with having a disc golf tournament and we were a bunch of disc golfers and having a dart tournament and having a pub crawl and having a stash bash. And that was our first year, 2008. And we raised $16,000 for the charitable union in one summer, mostly selling t-shirts out of backpacks and throwing events. And it was pretty huge and a pretty awesome amount of money for a local charity. Uh, and it, it stuck. And we got some media attention out of it. So we decided to keep going. And we did a Festivus, which is a cardboard sled race that was Ben Duvall's idea. Um, he was one of the founders. Um, we've had Festivus now for, I think we had our 10th one last year. Uh, that's a cardboard sled race at Lyle Arboretum. Is it on the 23rd? No, it is on like the first Saturday of February. Okay. Um, and we've had anywhere up to about 115 sleds one year, uh, kid and adult sleds, sliding. Yeah. What are we going to do on a winter day, on a really cold right. day in Michigan? Let's get some people out. And this has been an event that we just we keep doing, and it uses a really sweet resource, Lila Arboretum. We became friends with Lila Arboretum uh, doing that event. And uh, uh, Lila Palooza kind of came from that relationship, and we started that event. And uh, I can keep talking. Uh, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep going on about uh, BC Man. We started Raft Race after that. Raft Race was a uh, Raft Race reminded me of my childhood. One of my first memories is going to a Raft Race in like '87 um, with my mom, and it was it was it had been going on for maybe. 15 years before that, it ended in maybe the early 90s when the JCs kind of folded locally. And so I guess the BC Mavs is kind of like uh, that organization, but we're a whole lot less structured. It's just a bunch of people kind of coming up with cool events. Nobody gets paid. We raise money for charity. We have a bank account. We're a nonprofit now. We, uh, we've raised probably close to $300,000 for great. local charities in 10 years and uh, created a whole lot of fun. Had at least 80 events since the beginning, um, and we keep doing it. We just had a Bar Wars pub crawl last weekend with CIR, so they let us use, well, they drove us around in their uh, vans to seven local bars. We did a little economic stimulus and uh, had fun in my home. That sounds amazing. You said you guys changed a couple laws around here with that? Yeah, actually, yeah, BC Mans uh, were uh, advocated uh, for uh, a local policy change at the city commission level. Um, when we started Lila Palooza, we learned that you can't host an event in any city park and sell alcohol. Not really. um, but we had a lot of city parks and we yeah. didn't have a lot of events. And we thought, well, here's a problem. We have a lot of city parks and a lot of people that want to throw events, but if you can't have alcohol at an event, well, what kind of event is that? <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can still have fun for sure. But um, and and so we went to the, we we went to the city commission and um, got an ordinance introduced uh, to allow it in three parks. Uh, this is maybe six or seven years ago now. It started with Irving Park where we had built a disc golf course, mm. uh, Lila Arboretum where we had a good partnership, and I think Bailey Park which already pretty much had it. Yeah, um, Seal Brown. Yeah, but maybe it was the rest of the park. And uh, uh, after, there was a lot of back and forth amongst community members not wanting that in their parks um, because families you know, yeah. apparently don't drink. We said that we do, and some people do responsibly, yeah. and, and for and almost 
seven years we have been doing responsibly. The, a year later, I think, they uh, changed it to all city parks. Oh. So it's all city parks, including all of uh, Lanier Trail, because Lanier Trail is a whole city park, yeah. which allows us to do it at, on the raft race, because we have it at uh, Lanier Park, which was a cool bonus, because that was one event that was going to be hard to be able to do it, even though you could back in the 80s something you know, had changed. Yeah. So I think you know, a, lot of, <clears throat> a lot of what I've noticed here isn't that like there are people intentionally in the way, mm. it's that there's just a bunch of old laws and there's nobody, uh, nobody pouring through them, trying to fix the ones that stop cool shit right. from happening. And so if you find one, I mean, this might be a message, if you find a barrier at the city level, like, oh, you can't do that because that's against the law, well, for now, it's against the law. It's kind of Not forever. You can yeah. change, all laws are changeable. So let's, you know, let's figure out how we can change things. And, and, I, and I don't think that, I don't necessarily think that there are people that are, you know, sitting you know, somewhere in some ivory tower like, mm, we're going to keep this place right. from becoming yeah. cool. It's just they've got a lot of work to do, and changing the law is a lot of work, so that adds work to their plate. I'm aware of that because I've tried to <laughs> change a bunch of things, and it, it, there is pushback, yeah. but mostly because you're, like, keeping people from their family or keeping yeah. them from doing their regular job. And so you got to be patient. Uh, things don't change overnight. Uh, it takes time, and it takes building community and a coalition of people. And, um, I'm not certainly the best at it. I'm, I do it with lots of people. Sometimes we, you know, we win some, we lose some. Yeah, it's like everything. Like, so, would you consider yourself more like an entrepreneur, or like a social leader, or like what? Where, where do you fall in that category? Because you got a lot of things that you founded and started. Yeah, um, I don't know. I kind of consider myself a social entrepreneur. Okay. Uh, like I, I've always been a, um, a small business owner. My, since I was like nine years old, I sold things and went out trying to business so it's in your mowing lawns. Yeah, and it's in my family too. Okay. I had lots of business owners in my family. Um, I did not know what a nonprofit was, to be honest, until I was like 29 years old. Um, I didn't intentionally get into the <laughs> nonprofit world. I was just like, oh, well that's an, an interesting business right. entity and there's you know potential for getting some free dollars to do some things that maybe aren't lucrative in the like traditional capitalist framework. So um, I got involved in nonprofits because of that and in our community is heavily laden in, in those kind of resources. Right. So Sprout is a nonprofit, right? Sprout is a nonprofit. So how how and why did you start Sprout? Um, well, I started Sprout. Um, how did I, How and why are kind of the same question um, to me. I worked uh, when I lived in East Lansing. I worked at a place called the East Lansing Food Co-op, okay. and the food co-op is a community-owned grocery store. Everybody that uh, Everybody that's a member owns it financially. They pay to own it, and then they buy uh, their groceries from there. And it has a it has a mission. Uh, typically, the mission is you know healthy, good food from um, you know, from sources. here, from local sources, or at least clean, uh, organic sources uh, nationwide. Um, I didn't really know much about co-ops or the natural food movement until I did that job about 15 years ago. Uh, but I really fell in love with like the. Um, the mashup of community and food. And I went from being a cheese buyer who built a cheese department to uh, a cheese buyer and a dairy manager to um, dairy, deli, and cheese manager in like a really short time and learned a whole lot about that business. And uh, when I moved back to Battle Creek, uh, I realized how lacking our food system was and how, 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 how different it looked from my life in Lansing. Uh, are both from uh, small businesses, small restaurants that had really good clean food, to stores that had uh, good options. And uh, I wanted to change it, but I didn't seek out, I didn't say, oh, I'm gonna, we're gonna make an organization that right. changes this. Uh, it, it, that, that process evolved. I was a community organizer with an organization called Creating Change um, in the Post neighborhood. I learned about um, uh, talking with people about their passions and uh, connecting them together with other people that had the same passions, and then talking to people who had the power to uh, get them what they wanted, uh, wh whether it was resources or um, uh, remove barriers, change laws, etc. And I, I met a lot of people in doing that that wanted better food. They wanted to turn vacant lots into community gardens. And I thought, well, here's an opportunity. Let's assemble all these people together, and on a cold January night, in 2010, we got over 100 people to come together in a room to talk about food. Right. And I thought, well, shit, this is over 100 people in Battle Creek to come together um, 
where there's no alcohol yeah. <laughs> and talk about changing something is not anything to shake a stick at. It's not easy. No, that's to do. impressive. And I haven't really done it since in that big of a manner. Um, and uh, so we created Sprout out of that. Um, it took two more years of organizing community gardens before we uh, kind of consider ourselves worthy enough to write a grant. And I wrote a grant to the Fair Food Network out of Ann Arbor and uh, quit my job and started working for Sprout. Uh, I was working at the Battle Creek Community Foundation and the Neighborhoods Incorporated, um, helping people access small grants and um, working with neighborhood organizations. So sort of, I've evolved right along with it. And then uh, from the beginning, Sprout started as a community, kind of a community gardening network, yeah. and it has evolved into a food hub. Uh, what our food hub does is we, we buy and sell from local food entrepreneurs. Um, a lot of them are farmers that grow and raise, uh, whether it's uh, vegetables or animals, or uh, like yourself, people that create value-added products, um, like Cafe Rica or Dark Horse Spreads and their coffees. Um, uh, all the way, we, we buy things from all around Michigan. We source as close to home as possible first. Uh, that's our rule. And we buy, so we buy grocery goods, we buy meats, we buy vegan items, we buy vegetables, and then we sell them. So we help, we help all of these entrepreneurs uh, expand their markets. And, uh, and, and hopefully what that does, well, what I know that it does is it helps expand uh, our tax base locally because mm -hmm. all those entrepreneurs make more money. Right. Um, it, it builds our local economy. It builds all of their um, individual household wealth. And, uh, and it helps build community around food, yeah. connecting people to it. Uh, we have an incubator kitchen where people can rent space in our kitchen. Um, it's phenomenal. It's a certified kitchen. And, um, and they can um, uh, rent it by the hour. Uh, and then we are also a built-in customer there, so they, they can rent it and then we can buy. Um, yeah. So for some customers, we're a better, for some renters, we're a better customer than others. It depends what, what our customers want to buy. Um, and other than that, we also own a farm. Um, in 2012, we bought a farm uh, from the land bank in Washington Heights on Kendall Street. Yeah, I think I, uh, Actually, volunteered one year to help clean it up around there mm -hmm. with, uh, was, I think it was 2012 or 13, um, with day of caring. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, that way day of caring. yeah, we did that for several years. Yeah, I was, I was like amazed that that was a thing about here. I was like, what? Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, so in 2012, we got it from Land Bank for at least two acres. Uh, it was, it wasn't a farm. We turned it into a yeah. farm, and we really didn't know what we were doing. We learned. As we went, we built yeah. community gardens. Oh, we made, that's like, yeah. yeah, we made friends with we made friends with farmers, and then we started growing and selling. And we learned that there was a bigger market than what we could provide for. And we considered making a bigger farm and taking on more land. Uh, and then we kind of rethought that we already knew farmers that were growing things that that wanted to keep growing right. them. So we decided to stop farming and start buying more. We had markets and we wanted to sell them. So that's how we became what we are today. You also have a local economy too. Yes, yeah. yeah, so instead, of, instead of taking nonprofit dollars to build a competitor or build something that doesn't actually help local businesses, we decided to do something different and say, no, we wanna, we wanna use these nonprofit dollars to help build a local economy. And 80% of all of our dollars approximately uh, go right back to local businesses. That's awesome. Um, so last year that was around maybe $200,000 back in the local economy. And one way you guys do that is the Sprout Box too, right? Yes. That, yes. that really was a intriguing thing I learned this year. I was like, wow, the subscription-based, basically grocery store that delivers to you or you can come pick it up. Yeah. It's, um, so it's modeled after all of these subscription boxes you've seen online. Uh, Shave Club, right. Blue Apron. I mean, there's, there's one for everything. If you think of it, there probably is one. Uh, but there aren't a lot of them that exist that are local food right. distributing locally. It's you know food that's aggregated everywhere and distributed in certain places. Uh, well, how we're unique is that uh, this is all local stuff that is distributed locally, um, delivered, or you can pick it up uh, at at our place or your workplace. It really depends on what you want to pay for. Uh, we deliver. It's a fifteen dollars a week, and you it's really good value too. Um, if you you can our stuff, our prices and our goods. Uh, are far superior to most retailers locally. Yeah. You know, the only place that's better is going straight to the source, right, yeah. the place that we buy it from, the farm and uh, the producer. 
Uh, we just really seek to help them increase their revenues, not to compete with them. Right. So that's we're partners along the way. The market for local businesses. Yes. Like, oh, hey, we got this from X, and they're actually down the street from you. Yeah, so. we kind of hope that it's naturally, you know, we don't do a lot to make it this way, but we hope it's like an ecosystem mm -hmm. where we're all sort of like giving each other shout outs. Yeah. Because we know that we're helping each other in little ways here. Right. There. Um, that's the way it goes, just working together to build each other up, because that's yep. the only way. A uh, local economy or businesses really grow. Well, and most of our dollars locally are leaving, mm -hmm. buying stuff from people from somewhere else. Yeah. So it's not even, uh, like, I think we have a lot of room to grow together. We don't even have to compete. Yeah. <laughs> All we're competing against is people that are from, like, money, our money that's just leaving. Yeah. Like, if we can just trap little tiny percents of it, so keep selling, us from our So it's a Kalamazoo or yeah. selling you yeah. instead. Yeah. 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 Well, that even and selling right back to that. I would love for us to be selling. I, in fact, I'd love for all of our businesses to be selling to Campbell's right. and elsewhere. I don't want us to be buying from, gotcha, okay. uh, gotcha. uh, like, you know, buying from North Carolina and bringing yeah. in. Let's provide as much as we can here and sell out, because then we build our economy to yeah. bring more money in instead of taking yeah. it out. Because our, we, I mean, we do it with humans too. Our people, our kids leave, they grow up here, and we raise them. We put a bunch of resources into them, okay. and they leave and never come back. And then we do the same, the same thing with our paychecks. And then we look around and we wonder why we don't have what our dream cities have, and it's because we've chosen to right. not have yeah. it by like, voting with our dollars. Like you said earlier, and you know, everybody's like, oh, I grow up, and then I want to leave. Yeah. And I actually, Me too. Yeah, right. I was the same way. Um, but I've actually noticed a lot more people kind of coming back. Mm -hmm. Just kind of like, okay, well, it, it's not where I want it to be, so let's build something like yeah. that. Yeah. Like, you decided to do that. And it may not be for everybody in their 20s. Yeah. I think it's a perfectly awesome place to live in your 30s and 40s, though. <laughs> and hopefully we can you right. know, keep moving that year back a little bit. But I, mean, I think it's a great place to raise a family. It's a, a low-cost community. Um, maybe there's not as many jobs as we'd like, but there's there's a lot, there's a lot of opportunity to build. Yeah. There's a lot. I mean, our, it seems like our city's got our back more and more every year. Yeah, um, I've heard a lot more progressive things coming out of the city and the people that are trying to make change, and they're saying. You know, city commission, city leaders are kind of opening up their eyes more and yeah, doing things that would help. Yeah, I think it's just like I, I think that they want, um, you know, they want our help too. Yeah. You know, they don't want to be like, hey, you need to do this. Right. They want to be like, hey, we'd like to do this with you, or you know, how, okay. how can you help us do this? Right. Not like here, do this cool project I want. We kind of teach people how to navigate yeah. the system, and then they'll do stuff like yeah. put on events and mm -hmm. yeah. So, speaking of events, Penetrator events something you and your wife started, correct? Right? Yes. So, let's talk a little bit more about that. What is, what is that uh, exactly? Well, when I met Aaron, uh, we like to party, and I like to throw events, and uh, we, uh, so we thought we would start throwing some events together for charity. Um, we started by having a few uh, different events at the local Eagles establishment, what we call the Pen uh, Penfield Country Club on yeah. uh, M66 uh, because it's a really underutilized resource. In fact, our entire community is just full of yeah. underutilized things that people you know, say we don't have stuff. Now we have all kinds of empty buildings and, and, and full wallets just waiting for right. like, waiting to be spent on, on, on cool stuff. And that's a resource, it's just this huge, awesome, empty building and nobody uses it. So we threw a couple of adult proms uh, with different themes. Uh, raised a few thousand dollars for the local Eagles Club. We did that until everybody started doing adult proms. We were like, okay, well, that's not that's cool. Anymore. Anymore. And uh, recently she told me to start an axe throwing club. Uh, um, she, uh, I was kind of bored uh, last spring. She, she, said, she said, hey, you have, you have throwing axes. Why not start an axe throwing club? You're good at starting stuff. And I was like, really? All right. That sounds cool. So, yeah. <laughs> since you said so, yeah, it's, and, it's up and coming. Uh, like I've seen some in Detroit. Yeah, and, like, we're the fifth in Michigan. Um, that's at least that you can find on the internet. There's two or three in the Detroit area: Novi, Ferndale, uh, Auburn Hills, one in Lansing, and one in Battle Creek. Okay, so we're the, the furthest west. Yeah, yeah. We're the furthest. Well, there might be some hidden, but they're not doing any sort of. Any sort of social media, any any website, any anything. Right. Um, we follow. So we had 22 members of our club last fall. Um, the 
our, uh, the filmer of um, this today. He's a member, uh, Jess Mander. So I don't know, filmer's probably not the right word, but it's, <laughs> it's what came out of my mouth just now. Uh, and you all know what that means. Um, we had, so we had 22 members. We threw axes for eight weeks. Um, we are a member of the World Axe Throwing League, which is uh, a national, one of the national leagues for axe throwing. It's, like you said, it's becoming popular nationwide. There are axe throwing bars that are popping up yeah. everywhere. Um, that's what I do. I, I, I like to read um, alternative newspapers in big, bigger, cooler, hipper cities and see what they're doing and what they're up to and steal some of their ideas kind of get that and, and yeah. bring them here. And it's like, I don't, I barely come up with anything new. I just did. I do things that other communities are doing. It's just that you just yeah, gather the people. Nobody or? here right, yeah. is, is, is doing it. Um, we, we would, uh, so we're, we're doing that in a private location right now, but we're, um, we're seeking, uh, we're building the funds and the business plan to create a full, full on um, events, um, like a, a place to have fun, a place to not only throw axes, but maybe have nerf archery um, wars with your friends. Yeah. Or do some plate smashing against the wall to relieve some <laughs> tension. Uh, sort of like these lanes where you can yeah. um, you know, throw things, smash things, and control crush stuff. things, and then outside of this cage space, you can get pizza and play some arcade games with your kids and drink some beer. Don't know what it's going to be called yet. Um, don't know where it's going to be yet. Probably close to downtown or the awesome. central area. Uh, so yeah. We're probably a couple of years out from, from a full-on facility. Uh, maybe it's a thing that's in partnership with other businesses and events. Yeah, so that like we can a get, a, get a big building and do lots of things. Yeah, maybe Sprout becomes in, comes in a space and Battle Axe and Cafe Rica and Freedom City and maybe we all sort of figure out a way to share, grab those resources that are out there and share space. Yeah, I don't know. work together. Yeah. You know, yeah, maybe not. And we still do. Who knows? Right, yeah. So um, how do you get... Sign up and involve it. You guys are having like a little sign up right now, right? Yeah, yeah. Sign up just started yesterday. Yesterday was opening day for um, deer season and for registration for Battle Axe. And mm -hmm. um, you sign up at battleaxe.com, B T L A X E dot com. The B T L is the airport code for Battle Creek, which is why we named it that. Uh, we thought that was funny. When I, when I realized that, I was like, I was like, wow, that's actually <laughs> pretty, pretty. Innovative, but it's BTL and it's X, three letters, so it's just nice, perfect. Split. Yeah, yeah, it worked out really great. Um, and we, I mean, we don't have a commercial airport, but when I was a kid, it was like in the early 80s. And so I, it's kind of like a shout out to when the Kellogg Airport used to be commercial. And bigger, hipper cities, like lots of things are named with their like airport code. Yeah. And uh, so I thought it was kind of fun. Um, that, all that aside, you can sign up online. Eight weeks is $160. So it's 20 bucks a night. Uh, it's like bowling. Um, maybe it's a little bit more expensive than bowling. Um, but we do destroy a lot of, th a lot of uh, wood. Uh, there's a lot of planning involved in it and a lot of cost in building it. So we're pretty much a uh, break-even enterprise right now. We call ourselves a mobile private axe throwing club uh, because we can be anywhere. We can take it, we can take it off the walls yeah. and take it to your events. Uh, we, have, we have corporate events. We've already had Territorial Brewing Company out to throw access with their staff and have fun. And uh, we plan to be in events this summer. Awesome. Sweet. Um, all right, so what, I guess, is your biggest setback um, that actually really turned into, I guess, a positive game? It's something like I ask everybody out in here. You know, I think, I mean, this is my Mine personally, but I think the alcohol law that we changed for at Lilar Breedom yeah. uh, is, is the biggest, in my opinion, the biggest that, like, gain that has been made out of some of the work that I've been involved with. Because not only did it, you know, well, A, it allowed Lila Palooza to be a thing, and it's Lila Palooza is the next biggest event in the town grown and grown outside here, of the right? cereal festival. I mean, it's only 10 years, and I'm pretty sure <laughs> if, if you can. Audience, if you can name another event that's bigger than Lila Palooza other than the Cereal Festival, you know, I'll, I'll give you a sweatshirt. Because <laughs> I've got some of those. It's a great around. deal. Go ahead and try to find those events. <laughs> um, or build one, please. Or build one, yeah. And, and we'll, we're glad to show you how, too. Nobody, I mean, nobody at the BC Mans wants to sort of hoard the knowledge that we've learned. 
we would love we love for other people to start other things. We don't find it competitive at all. Um, that was one because we had a barrier. We couldn't sell alcohol. We learned that we couldn't. We figured out a workaround and did it on like private property the first year, um, but we didn't want to keep having to do that. Right. Um, same thing though with other policy. Uh, Sprout did some policy advocacy work around urban agriculture. We learned um, in 2012 when we bought our farm that you couldn't grow food on residentially zoned property and sell it. Um, a, I thought that was absurd um, because there's a lot of people who uh, don't make a decent living and wouldn't, and we have a lot of vacant land. Yeah. So it just seems like, well, here's an opportunity. Maybe not everybody's going to do it, but let's remove this barrier so right. that there's opportunity. Um, you can't, you couldn't raise chickens anywhere in the city of Battle Creek unless you had agriculturally zoned property. Meanwhile, we, we had this um, you know, citywide goal of bringing back young people and being a, a more hip, attractive community, yet we weren't doing any of the things that hipper, attractive communities were doing. Right. And so we, we changed uh, three laws, the, the, the alcohol one, and then an urban ag law and an urban chicken law, although both, all of, uh, both of the urban, chicken, urban ag and urban chicken laws could uh, be more progressive. They were a start. Yeah. We, um, we've got 20 permits for chickens in Battle Creek now. It really should be citywide because it's not like there's going to be some sort of like, uh, you know, chickens over yeah. overtaking town. It's, it, it's not, a, not everybody wants to do it. It's yeah, just, right. it's something interesting that some people might want to do. Yeah. Uh, but we did that. That's a win. Um, but it, it, it came out of having a problem and a barrier. Um, the food truck law is another one that we, uh, we helped, we passed. And that was about a three year project. Because there wasn't, food trucks weren't allowed downtown at all, right? For food trucks weren't allowed downtown at all. Um, they were only allowed on private property anywhere else, previous, prior to 2015. Um, when I went to City Hall to be able to sell vegetables out of a van for Sprout, um, back then it was, I was really met with uh, a whole lot of no, you can't, or um, you're going to need a background check. And it's just, this is the resistance to do business right. uh, was uh, funny and disturbing. And so we went, we just did it anyway. So it's like, okay, right. well, I don't, whatever. Come, I guess come get me. Yeah. yeah. We're resting me for selling vegetables. <laughs> uh, but I also thought, well, if I can't sell produce um, mobily, can people sell tacos out of a truck? Like, and we have, a, you know, we have people that want to do things in this community, but maybe they don't have the money to build a restaurant. What, uh, how can we get out of their way? And uh, so basically it's a Facebook shaming campaign for a year, just like, why can't we right, do this? Yeah. Until it, it built some, some legs. Built some legs. It still took a long time. They, they put a sunset clause on it first where, well, it's still, a, it's still a rudimentary, I mean, it's still a really poorly designed law. You can only have seven, um, parking spots downtown on Jackson okay. um, to, to have a food truck. You, so you can't be anywhere downtown. You can only be in seven parking spots on Jackson Street. Or inside the farmer's market is different because right. it's that's different. kind of private, yeah. qu quasi-private property. Um, and so they do food truck Fridays now. It, it's funny because we used to call food truck Fridays our event, which was, when it's illegal, we post it up in front of City Hall at the First United Methodist parking lot and have food truck Fridays there with food trucks while we were trying right. to change the law. Yeah. And people from City Hall and Toronto Building would come and eat. <laughs> and, uh, this, is, this is illegal, um, but I'm doing it. Yeah, well, well it was like, it wasn't right. illegal, it was on private property, but it was like, see, we're not like, like this isn't, yeah. uh, you know, this, this is, is the red thing. scare. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think those are some some barriers that we, we interrupted. And I think there's a lot more work to be done. There's a lot of things that you can't do still. So. And right. Yeah. That are that are uh, um, that need to be changed. It's a slow process. Yeah. So what what advice do you have for people that want to make a change in Battle Creek or anywhere else, or want to be an entrepreneur? Uh, so if you, if you want to make a change or do anything or be an entrepreneur, like you said, uh, a just figure out a way to get started. Mm -hmm. Just do it. Don't ask for permission. I see lots of people that are like, oh, I can't do that because it's not allowed. I, who said? Right. Who says and who creates the rules? And unless it's completely illegal, try it. Yeah. Not only try it, prove that it can be done. Prove that it can be done well with almost nothing. 
And then people will start opening up their wallets because they think it's a great idea. Yeah. And if it, if, it, if it has legs, people will pay for it. If people pay for it, um, if it's maybe a little bit you know, in a gray area, uh, somebody in charge is gonna figure out a way to make it allowed because it's generating income. And income means tax dollars, and it means a better local economy. Um, if, if it's not allowed, figure out a way to make it make it allowed. Figure out a way to make it legal. Yeah, yeah. Just because I think that people um, often think that if there's a law, uh, well, then it's not allowed. So we better not uh, we better not do that. Right. Versus like, well, this is a community of people that make up laws, and they always change. Yeah, and then. And, uh, like the Constitution's a living, breathing entity that is changing. Like yeah, all the time. Awesome stuff. Yeah. One thing I say to people uh, when they like when they complain about Battle Creek, when they it's like, well, what? Where do you want to go? What is the place? Where, where is the place that's perfect to you? And then they name you know whatever you know big hip city. It's like, okay, what do you think made that place great? Is it like the city government yeah. that made it great, or is it the people that live there that made it great? It's the people that live there that makes it great, not the government. The government is just a, it's just a package. Yeah. Like, that's not people. Right. That's just a thing that constantly changes. The people that live here don't want to make it great. So do, do something. Yeah. And don't ask for permission. I like that. So where can they find out about you or Sprout or anything? Like what, what's social media is and places um, they get in contact? Frankly, I'm mostly on Facebook. I'm a little Gen Xy. Uh, <laughs> um, although there are some Instagram pages for Sprout. I don't know, there probably is an Instagram page for Battle Axe. I don't know. Somebody could start. <laughs> uh, um, Facebook, Sprout BC. Facebook, Battle Axe, BTL, AXE. Uh, Penetrator Events, BC Mans. Uh, Facebook, 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 Facebook. I guess if you want to call me, you can call me. You can, you can text me or you know, send me a GIF. 269 uh, 832 uh, Is it the GIF? Do I sound like an old guy when I say that? I think it's good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I've always thought it was in my brain, but I'm like, I've never said that a lot before. I wonder if that's the word. I always say, I always say no, it's Jeff. Just mess around with it. Like Jeff is with a J, like a like a peanut butter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, uh, thanks for tuning in. I want to thank the library for letting us use this beautiful, beautiful room. Um, yeah, thank a, you, library. Yeah, it's a <laughs> It's a great place to utilize. So. Um, you know, we're right right here next to the historical romance section. Yes, thank you, Louis Lamore. Yeah, you've got some great great things to uh, read while you're here. Um, you know, be the change, and you guys have a great rest of your day.